This is Bloomberg Business Week. Insight from the reporters and editors who bring you America's most trusted business magazine. Plus, global business, finance, and tech news. The Bloomberg Business Week podcast with Carol Messer and Tim Stenebeck from Bloomberg Radio. Whirlpool and I have spent the last 75 years becoming laundry experts. But now, they're making it easy for everybody. I'm making your world a little Who doesn't love a vintage commercial? Uh, Whirlpool, of course, and they are front and center today. We're watching the share price down about 14% here. Um, what we love about these kinds of companies is they can tell us so much about what's going on, certainly in the minds of the U.S. consumer and what's going on in the U.S. economy. And this is a great uh, conversation, especially, Tim, if you think about it, on a day where we got GDP, we expected it to be hot, and it came in even hotter than expected. In fact, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen uh, just in the last couple of hours telling Bloomberg exclusively that the surge that we're seeing in longer-term bond yields in recent months, that's a reflection of the strong U.S. economy not of a jump in government borrowing driven by that widening fiscal deficit. All right, so good to know. And that GDP report for the third quarter, it was fueled by a surge in consumer spending. So let's get to our guest, Whirlpool Corporation, Mark Bitzer. He is with us. Um, he is chairman, he is president and CEO of Whirlpool, and he joins us on Zoom from Benton Harbor, Harbor Michigan. Um, Mark, it is good to have you back with us. Uh, your company, you came out and you trimmed your full year profit outlook amid an uptick in promotions. Investors noticed, and the stock is down uh, the most and to the lowest since uh, 2020. So investors definitely, you know, are upset about what they heard from you guys. First of all, let's take the big picture. What's it like operating in today's environment right now? Yeah, for, first of all, Carolyn, and thanks for having me back on the show. I mean, what we basically communicate yeah. today is, is a third quarter, which I would still describe as pretty solid results that we Year over year, we grew our business. Um, we hadn't grown our business for six quarters in a row, and now we grew our business, uh, more than 3% revenue growth. We expanded market share, and year over year, we expanded our margin by about 100 basis points. Um, but yes, we trimmed our forecast, um, technically not on the ongoing EPS, because we also had some tax benefits, but we, as opposed to 7.7 7 and a quarter EBIT margin, um, we lowered it to seven, six and a quarter to six and a half. So that is trimming the EBIT margin um, and the market reacted. You, you could in many ways argue probably overreacted, but it is what it is. Um, but I think that's essentially what happened. The underlying results, which we had, I would still consider very solid in particular compared to the pre-COVID levels um, and also compared to Q2 where we essentially went sideways. But in all transparency, we expected our margins to continue to improve. And instead of that, we basically moved sideways and, and I think that's what we see today a lot of reactions out there um underneath that and that's probably getting to your broader question about the consumer you know the consumer right now in our industry we see strong replacement demand i even products break down and you have more appliance usage post COVID. but the discretionary side of a consumer which is so much driven by consumer confidence that is the soft part of a business that is also the inherently more attractive part of a business because it typically comes with higher margins and higher mix. So we see right now a pretty heavy shift of consumer spending towards the replacement side and lesser to a big discretionary purchase. That's interesting, and that, that makes sense mm -hmm. given you know what else we're hearing with the economy, Mark. Um, where else are you seeing when it comes to uh, the consumer in the U.S., weakness when it comes to consumer spending? Is there certain categories that you can outline for us where you're seeing weakness? Are there geographies? Is it the higher-end consumer that's, that's actually struggling more than a, a consumer you know, in, the, in the middle or lower end? Tell us, tell us what, you, uh, what you're learning and what you're seeing. Yeah, and again, it comes back to my early comments about replacement demand. You know, a replacement demand, just put yourself in consumer shoes. Um, if you have a washer or refrigerator breaking down, you want to have it replaced with two days. You don't do the big shopping around and the mix up you want to replace. Um, so that is just a one-on-one -on -one sale, which again, is typically not a very mix or margin attractive business. The discretionary side where people plan for a new kitchen or remodel a house is the soft part right now. And that's the much richer part of that. So in general terms, you could say, yeah, there's a little bit of a trading down on the consumer landscape. There is a segment of call it a premium um, consumer, which is pretty resilient. 
but it's kind of a big mass in between where you just don't see trading up. If at all, right now, you just see more trading down, um, coupled with, you know, a, a promotional environment, which we described as return back to pre-COVID levels. Well, as a consumer, I'm saying, yay, promotions, <laughs> Mark. I'm going to be quite honest with you. But it does say something to kind of move the needle, right? To get consumers kind of off the thinking area into the actual, you know, buying of something. Um, so how aggressive are your promotions? And are you anticipating that in terms of maybe some weakness and the need for promotions that this continues into well into 2024? Yeah, and in, in, in earnings call today, what we refer to is we consider a promotion environment as having normalized, i.e. call it past tense, okay. which also implies we expect it stabilized going forward. So in terms of the, the depth of the duration of promotion, this is not any different from pre-COVID. And frankly, it is something which we expected, but it happened and occurred maybe one or two quarters earlier when we originally anticipated. And that again comes fully back to the discretionary side of the demand, post-mortgage rate increases, post all these horrible world news messages, that tumbled pretty much, call it in Q2, and consumer confidence ultimately drove that lower discretionary demand, which in turn drove a higher promotional intensity in the environment. What about the other part of your business, the part about workers, attracting and retaining talent, uh, costs that you have in terms of, of, of buying the equipment necessary to build these machines. How are wages for Whirlpool workers right now? Are they up year over year? Yeah, so first of all, to, to put it in a broader context, um, as you know, over the last three years, we were not only concerned about cost, we were also concerned about resilience and the strength of our supply chain. The, the latter part, we basically have, I would say, pretty much fully resolved. Our supply chain is intact. Um, we don't have major availability issues to that make a check mark behind it on the cost side over the last couple of years we saw the biggest increase of costs on basically raw material and transport transport has come down quite a bit and raw materials are starting to trend down and that is a favorable trend which we observe particular second half of this year and we also expect into next year well wage side um and again that is more driven by of our u.s factories one is unionized the other ones are non-unionized we basically have every year um, wage adjustment and we, in face of a labor shortage, in particular in 21 and 22, we did already fairly significant moves on that wage side. So, so I would say this year, we're not confronted with a massive wage increase. We still, of course, do year over year increases um, and that kind of helps us dealing with a labor shortage. And right now I would say across the board, maybe with some fewer region exception, we're pretty well staffed and, and the labor shortage is, is a lot less of an issue than it was, for example, two years ago. Hey, Mark, so what do you make of when we get the re like the retail sales numbers that come out and it shows a really strong consumer, and which kind of surprises everybody because we keep talking about student loan payments or car payments that are going to slow down the consumer. I see what you said about re replacement versus discretionary, but do you does that retail sales data sometimes surprise you? Do you, when people say resilient consumer, does it kind of just say, well, resilient, but maybe not so much? Yeah, I mean, Carol, I mean, I would say, I think you need to move from a headline into the details. Um, and yeah, the consumer spending, and that's, that's confirmed. The question is on what is the consumer spending? And, and we saw there's a lot of spending on services, um, restaurant costs have gone up, travel has gone up quite a bit. Um, our part of a business, consumer durable, and again, I'm talking about the discretionary side, not the replacement side. For most families, buying a washing machine or remodeling kitchen is a very significant part of a disposable income. You only do this expenditure if you have confidence in your economic future and the broader environment. And consumer confidence, and you, you can look at whatever index, that is the one which kind of call it April, May dropped off pretty sharply. So. Yes, I do see the overall consumer spending. I think when durable categories, it's a slightly different picture. Um, they're just on the long-term big disposable items or big ticket items. There is some reluctance on the discretionary side. Again, replacement side is very solid, but on the discretionary side is soft. Do you guys talk a lot about a recession coming? You know, it's been, you know, coming for two years. <laughs> And some would say, listen, we've already had, you know, certain parts of the market have seen, you know, or certain parts of our economy have seen it. But 
what's your best guess? As someone who runs a company, you've seen so many different, you know, we've gone through a very tough market cycle, certainly coming off the pandemic that was bad and then it was actually pretty good. People were doing things, especially on their homes. So do you think a recession is likely in the United States, your biggest market here, certainly by revenue? Yeah. For First of all, I would start with a caveat, but it's probably a lot more people are more competent about that subject than I am. So it's, it's <laughs> the way I would look at it. Our company in many ways is a, is a cannery in the coal miner. We see certain trends earlier. What I mean with that, mm -hmm. we saw right. the cost inflation in our business a lot earlier than most companies saw it. Um, at the same time, we saw the beginning of the cost deflation a little bit earlier, and we probably also see the kind of a normalized consumer promotion environment a little bit earlier. So most of, of what the broad economy sees, we tend to see maybe call it three to six months earlier. Um, with that in mind, you know, it's kind of, I think broader terms, the US economy is, is more resilient than most people thought. Um, so from that perspective, I, I personally do not see a scenario for a deep recession. Could there be something shallow? Yes. I think the key element will be going forward too is, you know, when when will the Fed signal a kind of a, a, a stabilization of, of a plateauing of, of interest rates? Um, that is a big element. And then, of course, what is a little bit more difficult to answer, when do you, um, when do all these horrible world news um, become a little bit more less um, or, or are we getting numb against it? Um, so that's the consumer confidence right. part of it. But again, from a person perspective, um, we don't expect a big boom, but we don't expect the, the scenario for deep recession. We're prepared to very small, modest growth in our industry, but we're also prepared to deal with a shallow recession. Mm. Mark, on that subject of everything that's happening around the world, our focus certainly... Not numb. Not numb, no, yeah. And our, our focus certainly on the Middle East in addition to other parts of the world. But there's also the business side of this, which is oil prices. And I'm wondering how you're watching energy markets, how you're watching oil prices. And if we do see a spike in oil prices, what that does to your business. Yeah. And that, Tim, let me be maybe, maybe a, a radio call is maybe not the perfect forum to comment on this horrific attacks and the subsequent, subsequent human tragedy coming out of this one. So it's kind of difficult to move from that to the economic impact. Having said yeah. that, um, of course, there is, you know, the entire Middle East situation if it would further escalate, has some risk on the oil prices. Again, there's a big if, if it further escalates in an, in an uncontrolled manner. Um, as you've seen the last two days, the, the oil price from the initial spike, they came down a little bit. Um, and, and right now in our internal forecast, but again, there's people who probably know a lot more about this. We expect also stabilization, a sideways move of the oil, but it's um, a lot depends on will there be stability in what is an extremely difficult Middle East environment. No, absolutely. Mark, we so appreciate your time. You've always been so generous, and especially throughout the pandemic, coming off of it, trying to help make sense of that cycle. And we really appreciate your time and trying to understand what's going on and uh, really appreciate it. Mark Bitzer, he is Chairman, President, and CEO of Whirlpool, joining us on Zoom from Benton Harbor, Michigan. A great gauge on what's going on in the economy at a time when there is so much heavy news, so much uncertainty. Um, really appreciate it. Lots more to come right here on Business Week. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern. Listen on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, and the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. As promised, we do have uh, the Mattel CEO, Enon Kreis, joining us from uh, El Segundo, California, on Zoom. Hi, Carol. Hi, Tim. Uh, great to be with you. It's so great to be with you. Um, I feel like I have a million questions. I feel like I want to go to a bar, have a drink with you, and just sit and talk. Um, I want to start with the Israel-Hamas conflict. Um, you were born in Israel, um, studied at Tel Aviv University before heading to the west coast of the United States of America. I hope your family and friends are safe. I pray that they are safe. Um, how are you thinking about all of this right now and this conflict? And is there a way to peace in that region? Yeah, thank you for asking. Um, uh, my family, my family is okay. Uh, my immediate family is okay, but and you know, of course, as an Israeli, this is uh, uh, very personal to me. And I know too many people who lost loved ones or have uh, relatives that have been uh, kidnapped and are now being held 
hostage in Gaza. Um, you know, on, on behalf of Mattel, we condemn uh, the terrorism and atrocities perpetrated by Hamas and stand against hate and violence in all forms. We, we express hope uh, for the safety of Israelis and Palestinian children and families part in the Israeli-Hamas war. Um, uh, as a company, since the Hamas attacks on October 7th, the Mattel Children's Foundation has been focused on uh, humanitarian work, including cash and toy donations to shelters and hospitals to support children uh, who are suffering. And we're sitting here all wishing for a swift resolution to the war and more peaceful times uh, in the future. Well, you know, and it's something that, you know, people who are, wow, gosh, I mean, up to 80 years old at this point have dealt with their entire lives in that area of the world. And I'm wondering to, to you, and not speaking on behalf of Mattel, but just getting your thoughts personally, how this ends, if, if a two-state outcome is the only solution to ending the conflict there once and for all? You know, it's, uh, it's a complicated conflict, um, and, um, and with now sitting at a time that is very volatile, we see uh, risk of, uh, of escalation, and, and we just hope for a swift, swift resolution um, and uh, wishing peace for everybody uh, as soon as we can. I want to talk about Mattel. I have one more question for you. Do you think Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is not going to be the leader that brings lasting peace? Yeah, this is not the time to get into um, uh, the, the political discussion. Right now, everyone is focused on resolving the situation. Um, Israel uh, articulated um, uh, its priorities. We're all really looking forward for the release of the hostages. Uh, there are 30 uh, mm -hmm. uh, children under the age of 16 that are being held uh, captive right now. Mm -hmm. um, about half the hostages are women. And we really believe that this should be resolved as soon as possible. And uh, we pray for the release, uh, safety and release of all the hostages um, uh, that are now being held uh, captive. You are absolutely right, um, but we do appreciate you weighing in on this because we, we have talked to you about serious issues in the past, so um, really appreciate this. Um, no easy segue, but I do want to talk about the business of Mattel. Um, talk to us about last quarter and the outlook. Um, it was a tough day in the equity market for you guys. Um, you did talk about tougher industry conditions. What are those tougher industry conditions that you guys are worried about? Well, we did see we did see the industry uh, being soft in uh, the third quarter and year to date, and as a result, we we adjusted our expectation and expect and, and believe the industry will decline mid single digit for the full year. But don't uh, you need to remember that this is uh, after the industry was up 22 percent from 2019 to 2022, reaching an all time high. Uh, so. Coming off uh, after such a strong increase, um, especially in a challenging macroeconomic environment, uh, we believe that this is a, a reasonable uh, situation and doesn't uh, reflect on the strength and resilience of the industry long term. The toy industry has been growing for over 10 years, and, and it's a growth category. So we feel very good about the industry and its uh, growth prospects. And even in that environment, uh, even in a softer market, Mattel uh, performed very strongly. Uh, our quarter exceeded our quarterly results exceeded expectations. <coughs> uh, uh, we showed meaningful sales growth and margin expansion with very strong free cash flow in the quarter. Mm -hmm. We saw consumer demand right. uh, increasing, and uh, we continue to outpace the industry. I think a lot of investors today, at least, sending shares down about seven percent, were concerned that you guys maintained your full year sales outlook despite all of the success of the Barbie movie. So what would have to happen, Enon, to bring in more than the $125 million expected from the Barbie movie and related products? What needs to happen at Mattel or in the industry to, for that to happen? Or for the consumer, I should say. Well, wh while we maintain the, uh, the top line expectation, uh, we increased our outlook for a, for a gross margin for our EPS and EBITDA. And still expect a very strong free cash flow uh, to flow through. Uh, what did change is that relative to our initial expectation at the start of the year, 
is that the industry, uh, we believe, will now decline um, uh, mid-single digit. But the fundamentals are strong. Uh, we do expect an accelerated growth rate in the fourth quarter and significant um, expansion in gross margin compared to the prior year and for consumer demand to be uh, positive for Mattel uh, uh, in the holiday season, in the fourth quarter and the full year. So uh, we are performing strongly. We're heading into the fourth quarter, seeing um, uh, stronger support from retailer, more shelf space, more representation in major holiday catalogs, um, and, and overall uh, a strong position with a very broad-based offering. Uh, of product across uh, play patterns, price points, and we believe we are very well positioned competitively. So, just to follow up there, the the 125 million that you put out there, um, the estimate from the Barbie movie and related products, would you would you say it might be even conservative a little bit, Enon? Well, we we did say it's uh, at least 125 million dollar of revenue at 60 percent. Uh, Operating income margin, uh, but the the, re- the 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 takeaway from from this is that this is one movie in one year, and as we continue mm-hmm. to scale our strategy and have more movies, uh, more executions, and not just in film but also in television, in location-based entertainment, theme parks, consumer products, digital experiences, music, um, and and other verticals. In some cases, that are actually bigger in the toy industry, we believe that uh, we have an opportunity to uh, capture significant value from our franchises. And we're not saying that every so movie let's go there. will be as oh. successful as Barbie, yeah. but we absolutely believe that in, in, in the aggregate, uh, there's a meaningful opportunity for us. Well, let's go there. And I've got to say, you know, I remember when we started talking to you, or it was in the early days of the Barbie movie, or you started filming. So it was kind of fun to be along for that process. But it was a movie that made us laugh, made us cry. And like I said, it appealed to a lot of different ages, which was pretty, pretty wild. So what are the key brands that you think have life beyond a kid's toy chest and that you think we should be all kind of waiting for, I don't know whether it's six months, 12 months, the next couple of years that are going to be brought to life in, in different ways? Well, uh, look, the vision of Mattel Films is to collaborate with leading filmmakers to create standout quality movies based on our iconic brands that will resonate in culture and appeal to global audiences. And, and the Barbie movie, and I'm glad you, you, you enjoyed it as much as you did, uh, is, is a clear showcase. It did. Uh, and we you have brought me back uh, to the theater already, for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd love to hear that. And, and we have uh, 14 other movies in development right now. Uh, different demographics, different genres. Uh, we have Hot Wheels in development with J.J. Abrams at Warner Brothers. Uh, uh, Matchbox in development with Skydance, which, uh, as you know, produced the uh, um, Mission Impossible movie um, that uh, did mm-hmm. very well. And Top Gun, we have a movie in development with Vin Diesel around Rock and Stock and Robot, uh, uh, Polly Pocket mm-hmm. with Lena Dunham and Lily Collins. Um, we have uh, uh, Wishbone in development with Pete Farley, Major Matt Mason with Tom Hanks as star, uh, Thomas the Tank with Mark Forster as director, and the list goes on and on. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we really well, you know, it's so it's very good that you're uh, so close to Hollywood out there. Yeah, it's good that you're Sorry, so close to Hollywood out there in El Segundo. Hey, we only have about 30 seconds left. I'd love to hear comments on the consumer going into the holiday season. Are you seeing signs of weakness in the consumer? Well, we expect a strong holiday season for Mattel. We believe our retail partners and the industry as a whole is well prepared for the season. And uh, we're very excited to be able to cater uh, consumers of all ages with a great product for, for the, in the holiday. I'm going to get yelled at, but I'm going to ask. 20 seconds, what's the hot toy for Christmas and the holidays? And for Hanukkah, what is the hot toy? Well, anything Barbie is, is, uh, is a hot toy, uh, <laughs> especially even before the holiday for the, uh, the spirit Halloween Barbie costume. Watch out for that. But, of course, uh, Hot Wheels is always the winner. Uh, the, the basic car assortment and the five-car uh, pack assortment. And look out for the Monster High $4 assortment. And Uno, 
uh, that will uh, will be very uh, will be hot selling uh, toys for for the holiday season. God, you're speaking my uh, language. <laughs> I love Uno and I love Barbie. Um, Enon cries. Thank you so much. Um, truly, your friends and your family are on our minds and in our thoughts. Chairman and CEO of Mattel. You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern on Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business app, and YouTube. You can also listen live on Amazon Alexa from our flagship New York station. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Well, as we reported earlier, we talked about Sam Bankman free taking the stand in his fraud trial uh, earlier downtown in New York City. Uh, some special testimony. Jury was sent home. It's very fascinating, everything it feels like, surrounding SBF and FTX. Uh, for the latest headlines, though, on that trial, just head to Bloomberg.com or check out the Bloomberg Terminal. I mean, I've got to say, the rise and fall of SBF, it was just, Tim, a few years ago, right? Just go back to 2019. Yeah, there was no such thing as FTX's exchange. Nope. By 2021, though, it was naming arenas after itself. And by 2022, it had become a force in politics and pop culture. By then, by autumn, it was gone along with much of its customers' money. The question is, how did this happen so quickly? Well, a new documentary by Bloomberg Originals, Ruined, the Sam Bankman Freed story, captures the head-spinning frenzy around crypto. Here's a little piece of it. I don't think he even had almost a conception at some point that it was wrong or right. I think he just had the mentality that he has to win. It was almost like trying to explain like business ethics 101 to a baby. Sam has basically become a villain in everyone's minds. This committee will not stop until we uncover the full truth behind the collapse of FTX. Will this be the last of its kind? No. This is the nature of capitalism. Get over it. everybody with more on this documentary by Bloomberg Originals Ruin the Sam Bankman Freed story. Let's bring in Pat Regnier, editor of Bloomberg Markets Magazine and also the editor of Bloomberg Business Week, Joel Weber, both back at Bloomberg headquarters uh, in the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. Hey Joel Weber, I don't know if you know this, but uh, at a point last year, earlier this year, Pat Regnier was so involved in this story, I gave him a new nickname and it was called Crypto Pat. Uh, <laughs> so whenever he was walking around, I would say hi to Crypto Pat. Uh, and it's Good to I didn't have know that. Pat with us this afternoon. <laughs> you didn't know that, but there's a reason I gave him that nickname, isn't there? Well, look, like Pat is Pat is amazing, and worked <laughs> with Matt Levine last year on uh, the crypto story where we went in Business Week cover to cover, um, and and we published it, and we felt really good about ourselves. And then the biggest story in crypto ever happened, which was um, the collapse of FTX, <laughs> <laughs> like a couple weeks later. And we were thus, like, thus wow. far, biggest story crypto thus far. <laughs> yeah, thus far. Thus far. So, right. so <laughs> as that was happening, um, a small group of us started talking about FTX and SBF, and I helped basically put uh, what became this uh, documentary in, in motion. And I, as we were doing that, I was like, you know, who could take everything that he's learned about crypto from working closely with Matt Levine on the crypto story and parlay that into whatever this effort becomes, um, you want to work with Pat Regnier. And that's basically, um, you know, here we are a year later. Um, funny enough, the crypto story published a year ago yesterday. I didn't know if you realized that, Pat. Wow. Um, so, uh, wow. so here we are, and a lot has changed. And actually, today, you cannot just make this stuff up. It's like so perfect. So this documentary comes out and Pat and I had been talking for a while about like, hey, we should, you know, write a story for Business Week that sort of takes a step back and like tells us all what it all means and it's tied to the documentary. And then, oh, by the way, Sam Bankman Fried is taking the stand. Uh, so it all comes together in elegant ways sometimes. Um, uh, so, so Pat, when you kind of started writing this remarks and, you know, here we are having SBF just um, taking the stand for the first time. You know, what what stands out to you about it all? You know, in preparing the, the documentary, uh, I we did some interviews with uh, a lot of people. We, we you guys went around the world. Hundreds of people. Yeah. yeah. And, but one person I spoke to who's kind of a prominent crypto critic, a guy named David Gerard, said something to me that really stuck in my head. And he said, you know, people in well-regulated markets don't really understand what it means for something to be unregulated. Um, 
we mm. take for granted mm. uh, how finance works. Um, even when we understand that finance is uh, risky and full of full, full of opportunities for uh, for trouble and plunder, uh, but th but there are bank compliance departments. Actually, most importantly, when you're dealing with traditional financial institutions, there's lots of checks and balances, um, splitting of roles. And in crypto, you're just kind of like handing your money to a guy, and you're, <laughs> you're kind of hoping you're hoping that that they're doing the things that they're saying they're going to do, and um, you really don't know what will happen. And FTX was just this like kind of very vivid illustration about like what what well what can happen is is that like everything your 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 money can just you know evaporate into a bankruptcy, and uh, you know I think that was why people were willing to do that and why regulators weren't able to get a hold of this faster is like a puzzle that I've been thinking about um, almost like every minute that I've ever been looking at crypto. So I, I was kind of trying to work through that. So what came, what happened at the trial today that you yeah. found interesting? Well, it, it, you know, so the main thing that happened was, uh, is that the judge sent the jury home. Oh, yeah. uh, that was interesting. <laughs> so what, what they're doing now is kind of, we're getting a, a, a hint of the testimony that he might give in front of a jury uh, as the judge decides um, what's relevant. And, you, uh, you know, I'm reading between the lines on the excellent live blog our reporters are doing from the courthouse. Me, me too. I've been uh, like, kind of glued to it. Yeah. And, but, but I think the implication is that um, he's making a case that he had lawyers uh, and the lawyers were saying, this is fine, this is fine, this is fine, which... Um, you know, I think goes to what it, it always looks like his defense has been, which is that this was an error and just a very big one. You know, I blanked up, as he said uh, more times than his lawyers probably wishes that he would. But that kind of seems to be the defense. And then maybe he's adding that. Oh, and by the way, my lawyers helped me. Well, Pat, so in, at any time in putting this documentary together, did you at one point think, well, maybe they just, yeah, it was just a really mega mistake? You know, I mean, I think, um, I mean, my point of view is that even if, like, let, let's, let's have that be the generous interpretation. You don't get to do that, <laughs> you know, when you're running, when you're running something yeah. where, where, where you have somebody else's money. I mean, at one point, one of his lawyers said, you know, it's like, uh, this company never had a chief risk officer. And, you know, it's like I, you had find time to find Tom Brady and Giselle. You know, maybe you, you should have. Like, <laughs> not having a chief risk officer when you are in the risk business is, and again, I'm just like saying, like, let's, let's be generous about it, is it's, is its own kind of massive problem. But, I mean, look, he's got three of his top lieutenants have pled guilty to fraud. Right. I mean, I think, you know, we can presume we'll, we'll we will uh, wait to see what happens with the jury in this case about him. But uh, FTX is I think it's just a legal fact at this point that FTX was a fraudulent enterprise. Um, and what can be confusing about that is that, um, you know, there there are often these questions. Sometimes uh, we will write like, well, what happened was, was that his trading firm borrowed from FTX and people, uh, and I'll hear from people saying, you didn't borrow it, he took it. And, you know, but that's actually okay. the mechanics of these kinds of things. It's like, well, the mechanics of how you take it is you borrow it, but that's not, it's not really different, you know? And uh, it looks, it, this was a substantially fake business. Okay, so you got to travel around the world with a really talented crew. We, we had a lot of Bluebird, uh, reporters participate there's some other people that got to participate in mm -hmm. this film ruin like who when you get to and we went to the premiere together last night like when you got to watch that like what what sticks with you and like who, who are you so proud of getting a chance to speak with well uh, let's say i was very interested to speak to uh suzu of uh, uh of uh three arrows capital who in many ways like that the 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 trade that they made that fell apart on Terra Luna was the first string uh, that, that pulled everything out. It was interesting to listen to him and his business partner, Kyle Davies, uh, talk about their experience of that. I will let viewers judge how they, how they, how they take that conversation. Um, uh, Suzu is currently have, has his own legal troubles. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, but, uh, you know, so that's that that's fascinating. We also spoke to 
you know, um, a commissioner at the CFTC who had met with uh, Sam Bankman-Fried uh, several times while he was lobbying to really get the U.S. to open the door to his business. And you really see from that how hard he was pushing to become... A, uh, and how close he got. How close he... And how close he got. Yeah. And um, I, I think that's that's pretty scary. I mean, it seems like in some ways it's like if... if, if, uh, if a series of trades hadn't gone wrong at one hedge fund and then that hadn't fallen through through another hedge fund. I mean, I think at some level this always was going to happen, but if it hadn't happened at that particular time and he had had a little more time to play it out, I think there would have been a lot more uh, mom and pop money at FTX. They were going hard at, get, at getting that hmm. money. Hey, Pat, one thing that I've been thinking a lot about over the last year is what this moment for means for, for crypto. And it's, it's interesting that this is happening at a time where we've actually seen in recent days the price of Bitcoin move higher on optimism around a spot Bitcoin ETF. But I do wonder, after you spent a year uh, really in this world, just uh, mm -hmm. so involved in this world, and now you're on the other side of it, mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you have more crypto projects planned. I don't know what Joel has planned for you moving forward. But um, he's his own boss do, now. <laughs> do you? Okay, sir. I'm, I'm just wondering, like, what, what is what is this as an existential moment for crypto now that we're kind of on the other side of it? I mean, I, I, I think they've got a lot of work to do. I think you have to be careful not to overinterpret uh, price moves. It's such a, a you know, it's a, it's a pretty opaque market without a lot of liquidity. Um, and actually, even when it was hot, that was always a question it was like, how many actual people are putting money into this? You know, I mean, um, it, it was actually it was very hard to get a read on, like, where where is a lot of this money coming from? You know, a classic problem, which the documentary kind of talks about is like we always talk about, like, well, this to this token's worth billions, that token's worth billions on these kind of very thinly traded markets. It's like how many people are actually trading this stuff? And, um, you know, it. It, you do see that there is some institutional interest in this. Um, you know, I, I I try not to make predictions about what's a, what's ahead, but um, you know, a whole part of crypto really uh, fell away, and it's not, I think, fully captured by the fall in um, market value. So I think uh, crypto is, went from like three trillion at its peak to below a trillion in market value. It's come back up. It's about a trillion and a trillion point three, but but you know that that change from a trillion to 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 one trillion is from three trillion to one trillion doesn't really capture also you know people who entrusted their money to something like a crypto bank and saw it and saw it go away people who who put their money into exchanges and saw it frozen people who were trying to get different kinds of yields and and, and had it go away and it's it's hard for me to see that being an easy sell to anybody for a really long time okay so one of the things, though, like crypto is, has this, has had this come down, and and I think the SBF taking the stand is a really good reminder of that. And yet, at the same time, like we've seen this enthusiasm recently again, where you know bitcoins continue mm -hmm. to like go up, and it's sort of like reminiscent of other moments in time where like bad things are happening, and yet it's like this thing, this thing that nobody quite understands is going up. Um, and that also made me ask you, like, you know, go, so, you know, the this ETF that yep. spot ETF, there seems to be a lot of interest in that. Is is that is that what it needs? Is that what this industry needs to have a chance that, you know, redemption, perhaps? I, you know, it would provide, um, I think, a simpler way to get in. It would get, you know, a, on, on the one hand, it would bring Bitcoin into the regulatory world, right? Like you'd be, you would be buying a security when you, you know, it would be the easiest way to buy Bitcoin, um, you know, and obviously what the regulators are, are wrestling with is, can you bring this, is, is this fit for the regulatory world? The fund will be regulated and will be treated as regulated, but, but, but what's happening behind the scenes in the Bitcoin market? I, you know, a lot of crypto people will say that you need to make a distinction between Bitcoin and other crypto. You know, um, one one of the thing, and and I would agree with that insofar as um, the 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 in, the investment case around a lot of the crypto that people were trading was like you know it was like a, a penny stock market blossomed overnight. Bitcoin has kind of a different investment case and okay. a different theory. But listen, we 
apologize. We've got to jump in. Mm -hmm. um, but it was interesting. We had a conversation with the folks over at Wisdom Tree, yeah. and they have filed for a spot, a uh, Bitcoin ETF, um, but waiting on regulatory. Pat Regnier, thank you so much. And, of course, Joel Weber, the documentary, Ruin the Sam Bankman Free, on the Bloomberg and on Bloomberg Originals at 8 p.m. Wall Street time tonight. Do not miss it. This is the Bloomberg Business Week podcast, available on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, TuneIn, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also watch us live every weekday on YouTube and always on the Bloomberg Terminal.